Hi everyone, thanks for coming to our webinar, Hermes, a buffering system for heterogeneous storage hierarchies. I'm Lori Cooper from the HDF group. I just wanted to go over a few basics for the webinar before we get started. Um, our plan is that our speakers today will talk for about 45 minutes and we'll hold the Q&A session at the end. You can drop your questions into the chat at any time, but at the end, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask those questions directly. Uh, if you want, there should be a way to raise your hand um, depending on your operating system, but you can do that as well to ensure you're called on. Um, you can keep an eye on the forum, the HDF Group's forum, forum.hdfgroup.org. Um, feel free to post any additional questions afterwards there, continue the conversation. And we'll also put the recording there um, early next week, probably. So I'm going to hand this over to Anthony Kugis. He's the research lead for the project. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, good morning, everybody. We're going to talk today about Hermes. The agenda we have uh, organized and planned for you is um, quick and uh, painless. We're going to talk a little bit about the project overview, and then um, all our engineers are going to give us um, some more details and how our, is Hermes positioned in the related work. Uh, we're going to show you a couple of libraries we we have developed and uh, we're going to end the presentation with a practical demo um, and you know keep in mind this is um, a community effort and we want people to get involved so yeah I encourage converse, like the conversation to happen uh, both on the chat and on the forum as well so I'll start by presenting the project itself um, the main problem we um, aim to address here is the performance gap between um, typical memory systems and um, the storage subsystem in a, in a machine. Traditionally, uh, concurrency on CPU and memory systems have been uh, developed way faster than um, the remote storage systems based on disk drives. That has created a an IO performance gap or an IO bottleneck, you can you probably heard it in, in the literature uh, as an IO bottleneck problem or performance gap problem. This, this stems from a couple of reasons, right? So the performance indication indicators of the actual mediums like memory and DRAM is faster in latency, is faster in bandwidth, um, but also on the topology of how, where are those resources available to the application. Traditionally, a parallel file system is a globally accessible remote resource. Uh, it's more like a peripheral. And in even that distance from the compute machines and the compute clients uh, increases the latency, of course, the access latency and, and uh, things like that. Another major difference here is the data representation. How are things represented in memory and how do we encode them uh, when we wanna push them uh, in the file system. So the end result here is applications experience a performance degradation uh, due to slow remote access to storage. So what's the answer to that? Like there's a lot of innovation in hardware and you know people keep developing new technologies, uh, new persisted mediums, um, and we have seen multiple new modern designs of, of distributed systems that incorporate those new hardware technologies in different um, positions, if you will, on the distributed uh, machines. So for instance, you know, we, people have introduced uh, burst buffers. Typically those are IO nodes that run, you know, probably SSD devices that faster than these drives. Uh, and they are shared across multiple compute nodes. They could be local, uh, modern compute nodes. There are a lot of systems in deployment right now that intro introduced NVMe SSDs or, or some sort of persistent mediums um, on the compute machines. And then of course you have like fancier things like a persistent memory and cross point and things like people are still exploring how should we use them? Is this a fast storage? Is this a slow memory? Uh, but in any case, here we have different systems, different technologies that all also run different software. You have typical best buffer installations. You know, we've seen vendors like uh, 
Cray, Data Warp, and, and DDNs IME that they are just their own software and you do reservations to them and you have access to a collection of best buffers. Local storage, flash storage on compute nodes most likely is left to the user, to the, to the user that got the allocation on those compute nodes and he's, he or she is responsible to deploy a file system in ext4 or xfs or something like that and then you have modern state of the art things like you know pmem file systems not like nova and pmfs that they were designed to support those uh, persistent memory devices all of that is great and and as as an ecosystem but the problems are all of them are independently designed deployed and managed that that all of this thing it's making it hard for the you know the end user to manage this complexity of hierarchical storage. So ideally the presence of those multiple tiers of storage should be transparent to the applications without having to sacrifice any IO performance. So this is where with this problem in mind, oops, sorry, we, we set out to create a, um, a team and uh, we wanted to address those problems uh, as a whole. Um, so the Hermes project was created between uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology, the HDF group, and the University of Illinois uh, in a small part. We are very grateful to the funding agency, the, the, the National Science Foundation, that, uh, who believed in us and wanted to see this project, um, you know, come in, in reality and in fruition. So thank you very much, the National Science Foundation, for, for this support, and uh, we hope we can make you proud. So. Overall Hermes, what's Hermes? Hermes is a new distributed um, multi-tiered buffering system, right? So as I said on the challenges and the problems, the main goal here is to um, manage this complexity and um, try to bring those benefits to the application in a transparent way. So we try to like write the software of Hermes to kind of holistically manage these tiers. Um, and you know, bring the benefits of, of, of each different tier to the end user, to the application. Because we have this uh, architecture here uh, in machines, in modern machines, we are also able to offer selective and dynamic layer data placement, which we will see some uh, of these details maybe later. Hermes is designed to be modular, extensible, and it's definitely performance oriented. The main problem, any buffering platform even the simplest Unix buffer is there to kind of mask uh, the performance inconsistency between the user and the end uh, back end storage solution. So you're using a buffer for temporary reasons. You use a buffer to stash some of your data, and usually those buffers are uh, deployed uh, in a in a faster, more capable hard hardware. So that's exactly what we're trying to do uh, with Hermes, but in a distributed fashion. The goal here is also to uh, support a wide variety of applications, but our focus on this level of, of the project, we are roughly halfway there, a little more than halfway in, in the project, um, is to support um, scientific workloads as our first priority. But, but the designs we have and the abstractions we have can easily be uh, supporting big data and cloud uh, workloads. So some of the objectives here, since this deep distributed storage hierarchy is new and it's still in deployment and people are trying to figure out what kind of hardware composition I should have in my new supercomputer, um, it requires a scalable and reliable, so like high performance software to efficiently manage data movement across all of those tiers. A lot of the times, and there are reports out there, um, this is left to the end, to the user. And that complicates things. Those individual tiers, if they run on different software, they have different run times. It's harder to coordinate data movement across tiers and between tiers. Uh, so this is something that, you know, we need a new software abstraction here to solve this problem. And also along with that, obviously there are, there's the, you know, we need to develop new data placement algorithms metadata management and, and, and efficient communication fabric. As uh, Anthony, an, Anthony uh, one thing, uh, the program director, you, you, you thank for NSF, the NSF director, uh, uh, Jay, uh, Dr. Jay Sung is here. 
Uh, oh. Do you want to invite him to say something? Uh, of course. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, hi, uh, we're very glad that you're here with us today. Uh, I, can you hear us? Dr. Song, uh, uh, you, I see you're here. Uh, you want to say something uh, for the audience? Do I have a... Uh, Thank you for that <laughs> comment. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I just joined. Uh, so I appreciate for this invitation and I'd love to hear more details on the project and actually quite excited to hear this release news. So um, please go ahead and just we'll, uh, we'll hear and learn more of that. So thank you, uh, Dr. Song, uh, you take the, take the time to, uh, to join us. Uh, that is certainly is, uh, you know, a, a big support and also uh, give us a more, uh, you know, more motivation or uh, um, or oh, pressure to do better job. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah. I don't want Thank to you. Anthony, you now it's back to you. Uh, okay. you. You know somebody is a license to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. From the funding, funding agency. Not just <laughs> uh, well, we, we're very happy to have you here and, and we, we hope you like what you see. So continuing as, as our objectives in this project, uh, we wanted to develop Hermes is, as if you will, this buffering system that unifies all of these tiers and abstracts those low-level details. Uh, strives, Hermes strives for being an application and system aware. Um, this is expressed by our policy-based approach to different workloads and different characteristics of workloads. There is no one system fits all. Um, we want to maximize productivity in the path to science by accelerating I.O. Um, of increasing resource utilization. We have had partners and, and friends of ours in the DO ecosystem, for instance, that say, hey, we're not even using the NVMEs. Yes, they, I get compute nodes, I have, they have equipped like NVMEs, but I, it's complicated for me to use them. So I just rather interact with the file system that I know. So we wanna make sure that, you know, every resource is utilized efficiently and we wanna uh, make sure that, you know, people get them, their money out of their uh, hardware. We want to abstract the data movement. Um, it's, it becomes quite complicated. Like if you look at the CPU caches, they, they follow like an inclusive model. But when you look at IO uh, and you have multiple tiers and you distribute data across multiple tiers and across multiple nodes, there are issues uh, arising like, you know, data co coherency and consistency. Like, do I have data buffered? in this tier, in this node, are there somewhere else in the system? What happens when multiple clients are processing buffer data? So those are different things um, that they are specifically uh, interesting for IO. And, you know, you, you, here we have a, a picture that's, you know, it's a very typical picture here where we have performance higher up in the tiers going like really fast, but then the, the capacity is like small. So this is the relationship between those tiers. Finally, of course, we want to maximize performance and support a wide range of applications. So with that said, I'm going to like give the, the floor to Chris Hogan, our, our, one of our engineers, the lead engineer we have, to provide some more information about our abstractions, our API, and our high-level architecture. Uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anthony. Um, as Anthony said, uh, my name is Chris Hogan. Um, I'm a Hermes developer uh, working at the HDF group. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the abstractions that we have in Hermes and walk through an API example with you and then just talk about the high level architecture a little bit. So let's start with some basic abstractions. Here I'm going to describe three abstractions, the buffer, the blob, and the bucket. Um, a buffer is the most basic thing. It's simply Hermes aware uh, storage and it's pre-allocated. So within Hermes, when we start up, we, we look at which tiers we have. Here I'm showing RAM, NVMe, and burst buffers, but this could be anything as Anthony showed in the previous slide, 3D uh, cross point, whatever you have available in between the, the final destination, which is here at the bottom. Um, 
So we pre-allocate all these buffers and you can see that there are different size buffers and that is so that we can, um, with a coin selection algorithm, kind of satisfy uh, user data request sizes optimally without wasting space. And the pre-allocation is obviously for uh, performance benefit. Um, so that's, that's how Hermes internals see the system. Uh, the user sees the system though through blobs and buckets. And here I'm specifically talking about the, uh, the Hermes API. So a user, a blob is just a sequence of uninterpreted bytes, uh, just user data. And users put those blobs into buckets and a bucket is simply a collection of name blobs. It's a flat namespace um, and you can put and delete, that's about it. Um, but as that blob goes into this bucket, uh, the system runs data placement algorithms and decides uh, where that data should be broken up and placed into the hierarchy. So here I've shown this user blob has been broken up into two pieces. However, the data placement engine decides that. Um, and it decided to send one, to a, uh, one piece to a buffer in RAM and one piece to a buffer in NVMe, for example. Um, and then at the end, if anything needs to persist, then we have, uh, they go to these storage backends, PFS, S3, whatever, um, whatever you, wherever you want to ultimately store the data. Um, so the next two abstractions are V buckets and traits. A V bucket is a collection of links to blobs. So here I, I'm showing four buckets, which are blue. And within each bucket, I'm showing several blobs, which are the green circles. Now, suppose you've structured your data this way where you want them in different buckets based on your application, but then you want a way to uh, make selections of blobs across buckets. So the V buckets are these red outlines, say V bucket one, for example, I wanna select these three blobs across those buckets, for example, just to group them or to iterate through them or whatever you need to do. Similarly here in V bucket two, I'm selecting these other uh, different set of three blobs. And these selections can overlap. V bucket two can also include something from V bucket one and vice versa. Um, now, basic grouping functionality is fine, but then uh, can we do something more interesting? Uh, and that's where traits come in. So traits are basically event handlers that are called when blobs are linked into V buckets. And these traits uh, take, take uh, a lot of different forms. You can, I have some examples here on the left, uh, hierarchy placement. So for example, if you say, this blob is very important, keep it at my fastest tier. You're saying basically, you're telling the system where to place this blob because you know it's important. Um, that could be a trait. Uh, file mapping, if you're saying, hey, I need these three blobs, for example, I have them linked together in a V bucket and I've attached this file mapping trait. That means I'm saying, I know that these three blobs need to be combined to form a file when Hermes shuts down. So you, you create a mapping that tells the system how to recreate that file and put these blobs at the direct offsets. That's done through traits. Um, here I have a compression example. Uh, for whatever reason, you want these three blobs to be compressed. You uh, put them in a V bucket, attach a compression trait. Now those blobs in the actual buffers will be compressed data. And encryption, filtering, sorting, and even user-defined traits. Uh, if you have something you want to do to your data, you can you can create your own callback essentially and uh, make anything you want happen. So here is a short uh, API example. Um, we're going. I have some pseudocode on the left, and then on the right, I kind of draw out what happens in the system. Um, you can think of a blob as just a standard C++ vector of bytes or unsigned chars. So here I'm creating uh, four kilobytes of Xs in a contiguous array. So we have this over here now in memory. 
um, I'm calling that blob X blob. Uh, the first thing I need to do to get that blob into the system is create a bucket. So I'm calling a bucket constructor, passing it a name, bucket one. Hermes creates that bucket in the system if it doesn't exist. Um, now, remember, other ranks or other nodes in the system may have created it already. So if it already exists, it will just open it. And then we call bucket put, which um, takes that blob name and the blob and does the placement I described earlier, where it spreads that, uh, the blob through the hierarchy. And then that blob is mapped to uh, this name. Um, and then later on, after we've uh, done some processing or whatever, we want to retrieve that blob back out. So we create an empty, uh, create a buffer to the same size to hold that space and call bucket.get, passing in a reference to this retrieve blob. And uh, the system pulls all that data from the buffers, reorganizes it back into the correct order, places it into the user's uh, array. And then when you destroy a bucket, uh, it deletes the metadata information about the bucket itself, and then it removes that data from the hierarchy, frees those buffers uh, back to be used uh, again. The API is really simple. Um, the V bucket and trade examples look about like this, so it's very small and uh, manageable. All right, uh, briefly, the high level architecture. So uh, we have seven components here. Uh, at the top level is of course at the top level of, is of course the API, um, and I'll just walk through an API call here to kind of explain what the components do. So if we call bucket.put, um, we that blob comes to the data placement engine and uh, it calculates where it thinks the best place to put those that data into the hierarchy is. Um, after it figures that out, it requests buffers from the buffer pool manager. Um, and then with the blob and the buffers, it sends that out as a, what we call a placement schema to an IO client. The IO client takes those two things and takes care of writing that data, uh, no matter where it is. Could be in burst, could be uh, writing to burst buffer or to RAM. The IO client abstracts all of that. Um, now, suppose that data placement, uh, that placement wasn't perfect, which it usually won't be perfect because we're always working with partial information. We can never know the whole system state at one time. So it's the job of the buffer organizer to kind of come along and clean up the mistakes. So um, it can uh, evict data from tiers. It can move things around. Uh, rearrange buffers, that kind of thing. Um, and then the git is kind of the opposite. Uh, the IO clients and the uh, prefetcher interact to get the data into uh, the system. Uh, so if you if you do a read, we'll prefetch more, bring it all into the hierarchy. Um, and then metadata manager is constantly involved. It's a distributed metadata manager. Um, Every operation involves metadata. Um, that's it for me. I will pass it on to my colleague, Kimmy, to talk about some related work and the data placement algorithms that we use. Kimmy, I think you're muted. Sorry. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kimmy. So um, I'm a um, Hermes developer working from the uh, HDF group. Um, so next I'll um, introduce some um, related work. So um, thanks to uh, Anthony and Chris, uh, they introduced us the um, Hermes big picture and with some details. Um, there are some uh, related works from um, Lawrence Berkeley and uh, Lawrence Livable. Um, for each related work, um, we list the GitHub repo and the published, um, published paper here um, for reference. Uh, so first, uh, the um, um, it's data elevator. So data elevator intercepts the I/O calls from the application and re redirects them to the burst buffer. It stages the files uh, on burst buffer for fast I/O. 
After that, um, a data mover uh, moves the data from the burst buffer to the parallel file system in the background. Um, it also uses HDF5 ball layer to intercept uh, HDF5 calls, which makes it's easy to be applied to um, many applications, um, but it only uh, works on the burst, burst buffer layer and uh, doesn't consider the situation if the data set does not fit. So the second one uh, we look at is the Univisto. Univisto um, is a system that exposes the distributed and the hierarchical storage spaces um, to applications as the um, single mount point. Um, the unified hierarchical storage um, includes um, DRAM, shared burst buffer, and uh, file storage. It takes advantage of the known local storage and the access data is built to um, burst buffer um, of SSD or um, master file system. It provides the uh, transparent IO acceleration for applications using parallel IO libraries, such as MPI IO and uh, HDL5. Um, so it uses the client server model in um, Univisto, which um, allows solving multiple um, application sharing resources. And uh, it also provides the opportunity to perform background operations um, with asynchronous flashing mechanism. Um, the client server model requires dedicated resources on computer nodes and unify the um, storage. The shared file access will need locking, which is um, expensive operation. The data, um, the next uh, tier storage, if the previous one is, is um, fully occupied, um, which um, did not consider the optimization um, for different data sets. So um, next, uh, let's look at the um, PDC work. PDC um, is a um, proactive data container. It provides an object-centric um, API, which is um, um, different from the previous two. Um, and uh, um, it's a runtime system with a set of um, data object management services. Um, in this work, the user um, can simplify um, define a mapping between the application memory and the abstract storage objects. Um, it also um, allows placing data in the memory and the storage hierarchy, performing um, data movement asynchronously. So similar to Univisto, um, the client server model allows um, the sharing resource and uh, provide the opportunity to um, perform background operations but it requires dedicated resources on computer nodes. Um, and um, data placement optimization is not studied um, by PDC. Um, and we um, didn't see the support to existing um, applications. So the next one, um, HDF5 uh, cache flow uh, is the most uh, um, recent work. Uh, it integrates uh, node local memory and storage as the transparent caching or staging layers without um, placing the burden of managing these um, layers on users. For parallel writes, um, the data is staged to node local storage first and then migrated to parallel file system asynchronously using background and from there, um, uh, your internet Only connection is a little spotty. Um, Kimi. Uh, Kimi. All right, so uh, maybe I can continue uh, from here, Kimi. I can just push uh, this stuff. So related work overall, can you guys see my screen? 
Yeah, okay. So we, we have done an extensive study all these years and we keep, keep an eye on the literature and what happens in the you know, state of the art uh, papers and repos and things like that. The main thing I want you to keep from this is we are aware of the efforts. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We are um, definitely, uh, we are different from this approach that these guys had in a couple of meaningful ways. One is our distribution engine is considering a very small granularity of dispersing data across the hierarchy. We are not treating tiers like separately, like, oh, I'm gonna buffer some files in RAM, I'm gonna buffer some files in NVRAM or best, but, but we are taking the actual file and we just spread it across the entire hierarchy, uh, both vertically, like in tiers in, from the top to the bottom and horizontally across multiple machines. So the data placement itself though, it, that's the tricky thing here when we're looking at those hierarchical environments. Uh, Kimi, whenever you're back, please just take over from me again. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I hope you can maybe restart or something. I don't know if you're still there. Oh, uh, yes, I'm back. Oh, you're back. Just one second, sorry. Okay, maybe you can continue here, memory hierarchy targets, and I'll have the presentation and move the presentation for you. Okay, so am I sharing? Um, I'm sharing oh, yeah. the, the slides. You can, yeah, yeah. You can uh, continue and I'll move the slides for you. Okay, yes. So yeah, so Hermes um, is a um, buffering system, which is um, um, scoping and layer model for uh, memory hierarchy. And the goal is to provide the capability to place files across all levels uh, of the memory hierarchy and the um, Hermes model is um, portable and uh, hopefully to be able to work on um, different um, data distribution. But data placement uh, in distribute, um, distributed. Uh. On distrib uh, distributed um, hierarchy environments. Um, so um, first, uh, let's look at the memory hierarchy targets. Um, from the previous um, uh, introduction from um, Chris and Anthony, we know that um, every Hermes system um, instance includes one or more Hermes nodes. And uh, um, a target is a buffering resource that is identified by a pair of nodes uh, with the um, target coordinates. Um, for each target, uh, we have the following characteristics, such as the uh, total capacity, remaining capacity, and uh, the speed or um, throughput. So we show a um, no local um, storage hierarchy here. So um, the problem uh, has um, became uh, given n targets, uh, placement, placement, uh, data placement policy an objective function with um, placement constraints and a set of blobs. How do we solve the problem of placing blobs such that um, the placement um, policy is followed um, and the objective function is uh, minimized or maximized um, while the constraints uh, is enforced? So while uh, we are solving this problem, we, um, there is something uh, we can think of um, like the time to solution, um, the cost to move data around, um, and also the um, load balance. Um, so um, this picture uh, shows a small scale um, buffering system. It has four nodes and a shared um, burst buffer. Each node is uh, equipped with a uh, known local RAM um, and the SSD. So the uh, burst buffer is shared across all nodes. Um, so it is not uh, practical to consider all available um, targets um, at the first in each uh, data placement. Um, by default, uh, the data placement uh, starts from the um, non local um, targets. Like for each node, we have this um, RAM and SSD. If the placement uh, fails on this um, on this node, then it will expand the um, targets to the to its neighbors together. 
yeah, if we look at node one, so it will um, expand the targets to node, node two. If the placement failed again, it will um, be exposed to the global targets. So to so in each um, step, the number of targets will increase. So to, um, so here we um, in total we um, explore um, three topologies of targets. So the next is uh, data placement solvers. Um, we look at the random round robin and uh, linear programming solvers. Um, here, so we will uh, talk about each one of them and uh, different data placement will um, place um, these blobs, uh, the, the blobs to um, different um, targets as we will see. So if we look at the random solver, for example, we have uh, blob A, blob B and the blob C here. For the random solver, it just randomly pick a target from all the targets. If the target has enough capacity to hold the blob, we will just place it there. So for example, um, blob A, uh, it randomly picks the RAM. Uh, blob B randomly picks the burst buffer. Random C, um, uh, blob C random, uh, randomly um, picks the burst buffer. So after this uh, data placement is done, so then uh, we can continue the actual work. So the next is um, round robin server. For round robin, we can tell from its name, it picks the next target if the remaining capacity isn't enough. So blob A will start from RAM and blob B will start from the MAME while blob C um, will start from the burst buffer. The last solver uh, we are looking at is a linear programming solver. Um, it tries to minimize the client IO time uh, with some constraints. Um, so the results uh, show um, blob A goes to RAM, um, blob B goes to um, burst buffer, and the blob C um, goes to um, MAME. So for all of these um, three solvers, we um, do extensive experiments to tell the um, performance difference. So next, uh, I'll hand it thank over. You, Kimi. Uh, thank you, Kimi. Um, Let me uh, put a couple of also comments here. Um, mm -hmm. So the way that uh, you, know, you guys saw Kimi presenting our, our approach is we introduced a couple of abstractions. The one is the buffering target. Uh, which encapsulates the status of each in, um, device, let's say, present in the hierarchy. Uh, and then we just work with that. Like we have a list of targets, we can order them certain way, we can order them by capacity and pass them to the data placement engine. And then always we will be buffering on the largest capacity first and to the smallest capacity last. Or we can start doing interesting things just by expressing the destinations of those buffers. Uh, in the system as a buffering target. The second one is the topology. We, we observe the data locality property in a distributed environment, and we want to leverage that wherever data are produced, we want to buffer them as much as possible locally. Of course, that in, in, it brings a problem what happens if you're running out of capacity in that local node, right? That's why we have the topologies, and you can create neighborhoods. You can work with your neighboring nodes. You can work with the same uh, rack uh, nodes attached to the same switch. So you can leverage a lot of these things based on machines and architectures you have available. The software abstractions we have in place allow you to do those things. In terms of the data placement policies, there's a trade of balance here. So either you're going for a very fast decision like a random or a round robin, which reduces the, the time to, to make the decision how you wanna buffer data in the hierarchy but possibly leading to suboptimal IO performance. You're getting, let's say, an average performance like or random policy kind of balances the load across all machines. So each policy has pros and cons, and we explore them in a sense of, depending on the workload, we might be like paying the cost accordingly. Most of them are configured by the user. We have a default policy in Hermes, and we have the constructs to bypass those default policies if you want to do something custom to your own bucket or through the virtual buckets and trade that Chris uh, in, uh, showed us. Thank you, Kimi. Um, next one is going to be Harry, Har Harry Haran Devarajan. 
who will tell us about um, the communication fabric in Hermes um, through the Hermes container library. And I think, uh, how can we use uh, Hermes from the user perspective? Go ahead, Harry. Yeah, thank you, Anthony, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm a fifth year PhD student under Dr. Zana Sun. Uh, so I'll be talking about the Hermes container library. Uh, which is essentially a byproduct of the Hermes, uh, which is the byproduct of Hermes. Uh, this work was pre uh, presented last year in Cluster, and the code is part of the HDF group repo right now. Hari, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Let's go a little faster because I want the audience to see the demo. So if go you, ahead. You yes, speak, I'll be faster. Just, yeah, speed up your, your talk. Yes, sorry okay. for that. No worries. So the HCL architecture, as shown on the right, consists of three parts the per core API at the top, the per, the per node HCL manager at the bottom and the network manager. The API provides an STL-like interface for data structures such as maps, sets, and queues. The HCL manager handles a shared memory segment which hosts these HCL containers we talked about. Any access to these data structures are controlled using shared memory logs by the HCL manager. The network manager uses RPC protocol and serialization library to enable internode communication. We have implemented in this repo uh, the RPC from Thallium and RPC lib as transfer protocols to support HPC and cloud environments. The HCL in, in a nutshell utilizes a hybrid data access model where the node local calls are served through shared memory and the remote calls are served through the RPC infrastructure to the node and then again served through the shared memory. This hybrid access model has proven to accelerate data structure performance by several folds. To evaluate HCL, we used three algorithms from scientific domains in HPC environments. We see in these figures that HCL data structure can accelerate these applications by order of magnitude. This, is, this performance benefit comes from two aspects. One is the hybrid access model where we don't do uh, remote RPCs when we are local to the node. And on top of that, whenever we are doing a data structure call, we aggregate remote calls through RPC. So because of this overall, you'll get overall better performance for both intra-node and inter-node uh, accesses. For deeper understanding of these analysis, please refer to the paper and you can post any comments uh, later on to me. Next, uh, we will see how we can use Hermes in real life. So as discussed by Chris, we can use Hermes using native calls to buffer your data into the deep memory and storage hierarchy. This uses the Hermes call library directly. Alternatively, we have provided several standard IO interfaces such as STDIO, POSIX and MPIO, and we can preload these adapters into your application to transparently buffer these, uh, the IO calls into the deep memory and storage hierarchy. In these cases, essentially Hermes is providing a mapping of how these IO calls should get translated into Hermes constructs such as buckets and blobs for you. Finally, we are looking at native app HDFI applications as our main use cases, where we are providing Hermes as a, at the VFD layer and the wall layer. So HD, existing HDFI applications can directly load them in their applications and utilize Hermes transparently. These adapters are motivated from our current target audience that Anthony talked about, which is scientific domains. However, the decoupled design of the uh, adapter and the Hermes code library allows us to collaborate with users and build adapters for other use cases, such as key value stores, Spark, or even Hadoop file systems. So it's, it's very uh, extensible in general. Finally, I would like to talk about how Hermes can be deployed in your HPC environment. In the first mode, you could have a co-located mode where the Hermes code will be part of the application. In this case, the synchronization between the application core and the Hermes code is managed internally and transparently. This mode is generally should be utilized in situations where applications want to isolate their buffering resources from any other application in the system. The second mode is kind of the opposite where we are trying to decouple the Hermes core and the applications. In this case, the Hermes core is run as a service before the applications are run and a connection is, uh, uh, is established by the applications during the initialization. 
This mode you can think of to use when you want to have multiple applications using a buffering resource, says that, for example, consumer producer, like we use classical in HPC, like data stagers. So the, this kind of decoupled mode enables you to have more use cases where you can share your buffering resources. And Great. Thank you, Harry, for that. Thank you for the details. Uh, and, and we should say that the HCL library is a byproduct of the whole development, but we thought it's going to be very useful for, for the audience and for the general uh, purpose um, community. Uh, the, the paper you know, had a lot of interest from the community, and the code is available online. And of course, all of this code, you know, we are welcoming the community to like use it and um, uh, give us feedback feedback for features or bugs or whatever it is, we're here to help uh, as much as possible. I think now we're gonna switch to our co-PI, Mr. Gert Herber, who is gonna run a, a demo for us. And um, Gert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can, can you see my screen okay? Uh, uh, I don't, it's a black screen. I, even I don't. Are oh. you having any windows there? Uh, no. Uh -huh. Okay, um, let me try this once more. Um, application, and I want to share. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Good. So here's my what I would call my homies at home setup. Um, it's uh, hey, we are all working from home, or most of us, and so I'm I'm using here a special. Uh, hierarchy. It's just my, my regular workstation. And I uh, created this little storage hierarchy that has four tiers. Um, it sort of internally has, of, of course, RAM and it has an SSD. But then I attach two external drives, a sort of a traditional consumer style hard disk, spinning hard disk. And to add something even slower, I added an SD card to it. So I have four tiers here. And um, in terms of the building, uh, the, uh, it's all linked here. Uh, you can go to the GitHub repo. You can build Hermes with spec, with CMake. I prefer uh, the Docker image, and the link is here. It's on our Docker hub. And um, uh, with that, uh, you can uh, get started in no time. And my plan was to show you two demos, one Hermes basics, gets and puts. But I'm going to, in the interest of time, and also have a little time of discussion, I'm going to jump straight to the second, the Unix standard I.O. adapter to illustrate uh, what Hari just said. And there is also a link here to the source code and uh, to the full demo. So I'm going to switch screens here. Uh, can you see that uh, screen that I'm sharing right now uh, for the demo? Uh, it's still on the slides, Gerd. OK, this is really annoying. Um, so uh, let's try this once more. Uh, how's that? Yes. OK, good. So this is uh, hyperlinked. If you go online, you get here. This is how you start the container. So you see here you need some shared memory segment. Uh, you, I, I mount uh, the hard disk, and I mount the SD card, and so forth. And then I'm going to jump straight to the second example, which is basically you want to show uh, I just have a standard uh, a Unix standard I.O. application that does F open, F read, and F close. And um, I run this program, I LD preload the Hermes Unix standard I.O. adapter, and then basically print here timings down here, uh, how much time I'm spending in F write, and how much time I'm spending in F write plus the F close. And so I'm uh, going to switch once more. Uh, <laughs> to bring up the uh, console and I hope that works. Yeah. I hope you can see my console window here where basically I'm logged into that Docker container. It says LD preload and I'm LD preloading uh, libhermes um, standard IO. And then I have this demo here and the only argument is basically how much data I wanna write in bytes. So I'm gonna write two gigabytes and uh, we will see what happens. And so what this does is it LD preloads uh, libhermes. It, it, it intercepts the F open, the F write. Gerd, the F uh, is it 
is it easy to increase funds for the audience? Uh, is it, is... Uh, I can try to increase the funds. Uh, oops, uh, that was the wrong direction. Oh, that's even better. That's great. Okay. okay. So, and you see, so this is the writing to the local SSD here, which is rated at about 200 megabytes per second. Uh, of course, the first number that's buffered IO, uh, we are writing two gigabytes, but I have, I believe, 16 gigs of RAM. So this is just buffered IO pretty quick. Um, but then uh, the flush occurs obviously in the F close and we are going down to about 160 megabytes, which is more realistic and which is what you would get from FIO or some of those benchmarks. So this is just to show um, the adapter work uh, adapter works uh, for standard IO and we also have POSIX and MPI IO in preparation. And um, now uh, we can, I, I, I propose, I'm happy to show you the other demos, but I also showed you here screenshots from when I ran this other demo where we explored different placement policies, the code is here, everything is here. So I propose we uh, start the discussion now because I'm sure there are plenty of yeah. questions out there, but then I'm happy to, to show you the first demo either way. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, sure, let's do that. Uh, before we jump to that, a couple of comments. I wanna kind of show something myself, Gerd, if you don't mind. Um, so I think um, here we have this one. Before we jump in, first, I wanna communicate that we're doing our best to make sure Hermes is gonna be available to you in the pos easiest possible way. You can be playing with Hermes with a Docker image. We have everything packaged for you ready. We're working with SPAC modules. We, you know, of course you can build it from source and eventually we will not work with uh, sites where we can just have it as a module. It's gonna be easy for, for users to just request a Hermes instance and work with Hermes. Of course, um, the, uh, the, the whole code, the library and the adapters and the container library are all available uh, to the audience and to publicly. I want to make sure that um, it's still under heavy development. Things are going to be broken. Things are going to you know, have bugs or whatever. We expect that this is normal. Please feel free to try them out, use them and reach out to us if you have any feature requests or any, you know, raise an issue or something. Uh, thank you, Chris, for putting together the slide. You know, you just go on, on, on GitHub and you just raise a, an issue uh, either for a feedback or use cases or, or uh, feature requests. With that said, um, links are all here. Thank you very much for attending and we can open the floor for questions, for discussions. Hello, I can ask a quick question. Sure, go ahead. Well, um, Chen, being a professor at the University of Rochester, I think it's just uh, overlap with uh, Dr. Sun's and locality concepts, measurements, and my work in the past is mostly on the uh, memory hierarchy that's before the file system. I found you, um, Hermes, really interesting and, and I really appreciate you organizing this uh, event and all the presenters. For the talk. So my quick question is for Chris, when uh, you talk about the API, see, from user perspective, a container or bucket has multiple blobs, right, is this slide. Um, it surprised me that the retrieval of the blob does not use the name of the blob. Um, yeah, it actually does. That, that's just an oversight. Yeah, you pass the name and the blob, correct. Okay. And then is the size blob information, so here is actually supplied, but uh, is that already stored in the metadata that you see? Yeah, if, if, you, if you're at a point in the program where you don't know the size, you can request it from the metadata manager okay. based on the name. Thank you. Thank you for this question. And uh, Chris wanted to have this information on the slide and I asked him to remove it to not overcomplicate, but here you are asking, how do you get the size? So Chris, you were right, a win for you. Uh, any other question? 
There, there is a question in the chat. Uh, someone asked a tool like Hermes will need to be deployed in hybrid uh, computing architectures composed of on-premises and cloud resident infrastructure and uh, platform resources. What does the roadmap look like for both Azure and AWS based deployment? I can try to answer that question. Uh, I'm not sure about roadmap, but in these pictures you see like eventually Hermes is a middleware, right? So you have your application and then you have your backend. If your backend is the cloud, then what all we need to do as Hermes uh, developers is to make sure when we have a flashing functionality, a persist functionality out of the hierarchy to whatever we're gonna uh, support the, the backend support, then for now we have a parallel file system. Of course, we can just talk to it. We can just open files, but like drop a bunch of buckets and blobs in there. But we do um, have a plan to support popular cloud infrastructure as a backend. Um, it's not it's not very difficult. We're not having it today there, but we will we plan to do it. When I'm guessing a year from now. Any other question? Mm -hmm. Maybe one thing that maybe um, uh, people might ask themselves, and I wanted to mention that uh, in the, as part of the first demo, people might ask, well, how does MPI relate to all of that? And uh, the, uh, we want to point out that at the moment, we really use MPI only as a, as a vehicle not for communication, but basically to launch processes and to control processes. So the communication inside of Hermes is fundamentally RPC based and doesn't use MPI. And we really, that's why sometimes we tell people, well, you have to do MPI in it. And then people say, well, why would I do MPI in it? Because Hermes doesn't depend on it. Well, the answer is Hermes does not depend on it. We just sort of use it as a vehicle to manage processes. But, and, and we ultimately try to uh, eliminate that dependency, but let's be practical here and, and not make our life artificially complicated. So uh, there's no MPI inside of Hermes. It's really just a vehicle to, to manage processes. Oh, uh, there is a question here in the forum. Do you have some performance data or comparison with the standard HD? HDF5 library that, that does not use Hermes. Well, to that, I would say come back to our next webinar uh, <laughs> because Kimi is actually developing a, a virtual file driver at the moment uh, for HDF5. And uh, I'm sure we'll report uh, specifically on that topic, uh, uh, how, how can help, how Hermes can help to accelerate HDF5 uh, workloads. And so I, I, yeah, all I would say is come back next time and we'll have more on that. That was a great pass for the next webinar, Gerd. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we plan to have a series of webinars moving forward. So yes, please pay attention to your email. We're gonna be inviting you and we're gonna give you more updates as we go along. Mm -hmm. Okay. I and think it's 12 p.m. Uh, yeah. So if we don't have any other questions, um, I guess we want to encourage you again to like get involved, give us feedback. Um, mm -hmm. We are here, we are really willing to like work with like application developers and see your, you know, what your application is doing and how can Hermes help you out. Also, um, you know, sites, if you're running a, a cluster in a university, if you're running, let's, let's talk, see what's your architecture like, what are the machines you have and the devices you have, see where Hermes can fit into the picture and give us features that you, wanna, we, you want us to add. More information, there's a bunch of um, uh, publications coming out of this project. Uh, we also have a Hermes uh, page we're like summarizing a few of the things we talked today. And of course the GitHub repositories have, um, you know, information. We're working on a documentation. I, we are a little behind on the documentation, but you know, we are almost there. We're working on hard on that and uh, we will enhance the repository with more documentation for you. Right now, whoever is brave, you can go and be, uh, you know, try to be brave and work with the repo we have. 
Okay, with that said, thank you very much. I think the recording is going to be available. Please, uh, you know, HDF forum is there if you have more questions and also feel free to contact us directly. Thank you all for attending. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.